Welcome back to Approved Unto God. I'm Joshua Govitz. Thought I'd change my setup a little bit just to mix things up. I had the uh, camera the other direction with the bookshelf for about a year and uh, don't want you to get sick of that. And I know I get sick of the same thing over and over. So I like to mix things up a little bit and we'll give this a shot and uh, might even change a camera angle next time from over there and get a little more of the uh, living room view in there. But uh, yeah, uh, you know, some people are afraid of change, but change isn't always bad. Sometimes we have to get out of our comfort zones, you know, and uh, you got to be willing to do that because uh, life can get uncomfortable real quick sometimes and we have to know how to adjust. It's hard to break those routines, those habits, and sometimes those routines and habits that we get can place us in bondage. And that's not the message today, but just food for thought. Look at uh, chapter number 23 and verse number 10. We're going to try to move along here and do a good portion of the scripture today. Speak not in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of thy words. Okay, we already did that. Remove not the old landmark and enter not into the fields of the fatherless. And we labored on this message a little bit before in the last message. Uh, where, where is the scripture here? Uh, let me see. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. So two messages ago. Uh, we have a problem, and it's always been a problem, of people feeling they're entitled, especially the rich that would would want to always expand their borders into the fields of the fatherless. Uh, we had that over there in California, over in LA, when they made the Dodger Stadium. There was a bunch of poor people. Uh, oh, and it, it was kind of a gravel pit type of area. It was a piece of land, but there was a lot of poor people living in that area. And the rich man that you know, I believe he was the owner of the Dodgers, said, I want this land, and he had people physically removed from that land. These poor people, it was the poor Mexican people, and they physically removed them. They were crying and all this. I never knew this until recently. I was watching a, just a few first few minutes of a video about Fernando Valenzuela. He was a pitcher for the Dodgers in the 80s. And, uh, you know, but that has always been the case with rich men that want to increase their borders and they don't care who they hurt. You know, this is another illustration, but it's fitting. You know, last time I was talking to Brother Matt and I was telling him about that movie, Shane. It's an old movie from the 50s. And there was this rich man that was trying to take over the land of this poorer man and his wife. And he wanted to expand his borders. He was trying to remove the ancient landmarks and a man kind of strolled into town and his name was Shane and he strolled right into their neighborhood right into their house you know it, it was uh, like a divine intervention this man would fight for them this man was a gunslinger and this man would uh, end up fighting the battle in the place of this landowner he started caring for the family, caring for, for the man's and, and the woman's son. And, and the son really looked up to this, this man, this stranger that came out of nowhere. But what does the Bible say? Remo remove not the old landmark and enter not into the fields of the fatherless. For their redeemer is mitre. He shall plead their cause with thee. And in the movie, the guy came in there and he pleaded the cause. Sometimes God uses men. Sometimes a, a God will send the right person to intervene. Uh, he does that in the ministry. You know, he needs a voice. He's not going to preach from heaven. He's not going to preach the gospel with angels from heaven. He will during the tribulation period. But in this church age, he's going to work through men, and he will send men to preach the gospel and give the message. And uh, God uses men. And sometimes in this life, those that are greedy will be judged in this life and somebody will intervene. Sometimes not. And those those people, those poor people over there in L.A. where the Dodger Stadium was built, 
there was no intervention. But that is not overlooked by God. That is going to be exacted. If those sinners never repent, if those sinners never receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, God is going to exact vengeance for those people because he says so. He says, remove not the old landmarks, enter not in the fields of the fatherless, for their Redeemer is mighty. Their Redeemer is mighty. He shall plead their cause with thee. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I shall repay. It's not our place to take vengeance. Uh, and then I have a little reference here from chapter 22. In verses 22 through 23, rob not the poor because he is poor. And this is more referencing people that have a lot of money. Here, Solomon is addressing his son. He's saying, son, you have everything. You're going to be the king in my place. And do not rob the poor because he is poor. Don't take advantage of the poor. Be good to the poor. Neither oppress the afflicted in the gate. Sometimes the afflicted would be found in the gate and uh, they would be begging for alms. Don't oppress them, bless them. Have a bountiful eye. For the Lord will plead their cause. If you're going to put yourself against them, you're putting yourself against God. You're, you're pitting yourself against your Creator because God loves the poor. He creates the poor. He makes people poor sometimes. For the Lord will plead their cause and spoil the soul of those Spoil, spoil the soul of those that spoiled them. You reap what you sow. God's going to spoil you. you. You think you're going to spoil somebody's and take and take from people that can't afford to lose? God says, I'm going to make you poor. I'm going to take from you. He might just take your soul if you're not ready. You know, there was a rich man that was building barns in Luke. And... God came for his soul. He, he took no thought for his soul. And God said, Thou fool, today thy soul shall be required of thee. You don't want to be that guy. You want to be prepared. You want to be saved. Verse number 11, uh, verse number 12. Apply thine heart unto instruction and thine ears to the words of knowledge. You know, this Bible is not going to cause any effect in your life. It's not going to it's not going to help really in any way if you do not apply it. Too many people are hearers of the word and not doers of the word. Thy word have I hid in my heart so I can win a competition and quote in scriptures amongst other teenagers. It's not what David said. He says Thine word have I hid in my heart that I might impress others. No. Thine word have I hid in my heart that I could sound smarter than the rest. Thine word have I hid in my heart that I could be the best preacher in, 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 in the camp meeting. No. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So we need to get the word of God, receive it on good ground, and, and the good ground is, is, is the, the heart that wants to apply. Apply thine heart unto instruction. And thine ears to the words of knowledge. It's not enough to hear the words of knowledge. It's not enough to go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Sunday school. It's not enough to play sermons in the background as you don't pay much attention to them. You're not going to learn the Bible. You're not going to grow by osmosis. Yes, the Word of God is powerful. Yes, the Word of God can give peace. Yes, the Word of God probably ought to be played often and frequently, the preaching of the Word of God. But we have to be careful not to make it entertainment, not for it just to be background noise, but to be applied. Apply thine heart unto instruction and thine ears the words of knowledge. You know, if you have a box of band-aids, you can believe in, the, in those band-aids, what they are there for. You can read the instructions about them and understand them quite well. But if you do not open the box and you do not apply the band-aid to the wound, it doesn't matter how much you know about band-aids because you're not applying it. 
God says, I want you to be applying the scripture. You need to apply these words of knowledge so that they're no longer just knowledge, but they're wisdom. That's the knowledge and you put it into action. Verse number 13, withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with a rod, he shall not die. God reassures those that say, oh, I don't know about hitting my child, you know, I might scar him. Oh, I, I, I'm afraid I'm going to kill my child if I, well, God says, don't worry about that. He shall not die when thou beatest him with a rod. You correct your child on the fanny. It'll be okay. God put a lot of muscle there. They can take it. Now you correct them, and you have to have the proper attitude. You cannot correct them in anger. You have to correct them and control your spirit while you correct. Otherwise, be careful. You don't you don't go around smacking your children in the mouth. You don't go around throwing them against the wall. That's not what the Bible is talking about. It's controlled correction. And it's very, very beneficial to a child. If you don't believe that, just look at the kids nowadays that had to sit in a corner. They don't even know what gender they are. Verse number 14. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and shalt deliver his soul from hell. If a child knows how to respond to the correction from a mother or a father that they can see, when the Holy Spirit corrects them and shows their lost condition, they will respond to the Holy Spirit, to the Holy Spirit's correction. Now, if there's no correction seen in their earthly parents, then when the Holy Spirit tries to correct them, they're already used to no correction, and they're just not going to respond. Uh, I tell you, th there's something to that, because the older generation that even the teachers would correct the children. You've seen a great response. You've seen a great uh, buildup of character and, and, and a lot more people fearing the Lord. But now we see a generation of children growing up that do not fear the Lord. We see a generation in their 20s and 30s and 40s that just do not fear God. And it's evident. They're, they're not in church. They go to church. They go to some mega church where God is cool with worldliness. And uh, he accepts them just as they are, and they can leave as they came. And it's because there's been no correction. Verse number 15, My son, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. What would be pleasing to Solomon would be a son that has a wise heart. A son that makes the scripture rule his heart. My heart shall rejoice, even mine. You want to please your parents? Do right by God. And you want to put a smile on their face? Honor God with your life. And, and in turn, you will be honoring them. Yea, my reign shall rejoice when thy lips speak right things. We have so many children that back talk their parents and, and cuss around their parents. and You know, that used to be unheard of. To cuss around your parents in the old days, oh, you'd get your mouth washed out with soap. But nowadays, the kids just back talk their parents, they get no correction. And then they, when they get married, they back talk and, and, and cuss out their wife, or the wife cuts out, cusses out their husband. And uh, the parents aren't rejoicing. But if you speak right things, if you would fill yourself with the knowledge of God and fill yourself with the Holy Spirit and be a vessel of honor, my reign shall rejoice, Solomon says, deep within my soul. When you speak right things, I'm going to be a real proud daddy. And our Heavenly Father is going to be proud of his children when they walk in truth. When they make application of what they learn in the Bible. Verse number 17. Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. It's easy to look around you and see the prosperity of sinners, the prosperity of the wicked. Then do we wonder why others prosper, living so wicked year after year, the old song said. Farther along we'll know all about it, farther along we'll understand why. And 
all the answers will be provided, I believe, at the judgment seat. Knox seems to disagree, and he thinks it's insulting, that song, that, like, basically we're going to be asking God. But I don't think we have to ask God. I think we'll just understand it all by and by. I think once we see him, life's trials will seem so small. The harsh conditions that we had to go through will be easily understood that it was for our good. It was to develop us. It was to cause us to be more like Christ. You know, when before, you know, smartphones and taking pictures in the old days, you had to develop the film and it had to be in the dark for it to develop. And it could not be in the bright light. It would ruin it right away. You know, but sometimes God puts us through darkness to develop us. To develop our trust in him you know it's easy to trust god when everything's going good but when everything starts falling apart and, and the depression hits you and and it seems like there's no way out god sometimes puts us through that so we can be humbled maybe we've been uh living this life on our own and without need of god Maybe we're like the Laodiceans. We're increased with goods and have need of nothing. We're not praying. We're not begging God. God says, I need you to to trust in me. I need you to depend upon me. And he might put you in a dark place. And like Brother Jeff Fox told me when I was in a dark place, he says, you just need to take the Father's hand and trust him as a little child that he can get you out. You may not know the way out, but God knows the way out. And the Bible speaks of and Isaiah making sparks, your own sparks, trying to light your own way, trying to find your own way out. And it says that you'll go to sleep in sorrow. God wants you to depend on him. He wants you to trust him. Sometimes he has to make you to lie down in green pastures. That's not fun. But in the pastures, in the green pastures, in the valley, there's much growth. When there's pruning going on of the tree, sometimes it need, it's needed, it's necessary to bring forth new growth. And pruning hurts, but God's only trying to make you more like himself. God doesn't do that with the sinner. Don't envy the sinner. They're bastards. They're allowed to run wild. They're allowed to do what they want. They prosper, yes, but God's a good God and he knows their latter end. So don't forget that. But God will put you through the fire because he wants you to come out like gold. But be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. Instead of envying sinners, just fear the Lord. Don't fear what man can do unto you. Don't fear uh, not having a, another meal. Don't, feel, don't fear not having clothes, not having shelter. God will provide that. God is a good God, and we ought to be in the fear of the Lord. That's the only thing we need, we need to fear. Fear the Lord. Do right. This other fear, God says, I am not the author of that. He says, I have not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of a sound mind. Verse number 18. Oh, I got a little reference here. Let's go to it real quick. Philippians 2.12. Book of Philippians 2.12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You know what? Don't be worried about everybody else. Focus on yourself, your own walk with God, and, and do this with fear and trembling. Paul said, in light of the judgment seat, he said, I persuade men knowing the terror of the Lord. We want to bring our bodies into, subje into subjection to the Word of God. We want to make application so we can be blameless when we stand before Him. Uh, if you keep a short account with the Lord on your sins, uh, He doesn't have to bring anything up at the judgment seat. But I think if you regard the iniquity, he, you may deal with it in front of Him, which I think would be very terrifying. Uh, but I would rather shut my eyes and in faith say, Lord, I know you're there. I know that I'm a priest and I know that I have access to you. Help me, Lord, 
to not do this sin again. Help me, Lord. Forgive me for, for doing what I've done that broke fellowship. Please renew the fellowship. And then it's restored, and then you leave it alone. You don't dwell upon it. You don't you don't whip yourself. You don't chastise yourself. You don't uh, crawl over glass. You don't act like a Catholic and start trying to do some sort of penance. That's not what God wants you to do. He wants you just to unload that burden, that sin, and say, Lord, I've done wrong. Confess it. And he's faithful and just, and he will forgive your sins. And you'll have fellowship with him. For surely there is an end, and thine expectation, expectation shall not be cut off. And that end is the judgment seat. That end is heaven. That end is seeing him face to face. And thine expectation shall not be cut off. You expect it because you believe the word of God. You expect that living righteous will pay off. Living righteous not in yourself, but righteous in, in submission to, to God's Holy Spirit for us New Testament saints. For surely there is an end. One day this is all going to be over, and this is one big trial, one big test. This is a proving ground, this is boot camp, and one day it'll all be over, and you will see him face to face, and you will understand. You will understand why life had so many hard times, because God was developing you. He wanted you to be like himself. He wanted you to have fellowship of his sufferings. So you can also reign with him. If you suffer with him, you shall also reign with him, the Bible says. Let's look at Romans chapter number 8 and verse 19. We've got a few cross references here. Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. Let's get a little bit of uh, background here. Let's go to first verse number 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. So we shouldn't be fearing. That's bondage. Fear have torment. But ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him. So that's why you're suffering. That's why it's not all hunky-dory. It's not like the sinner's life that you envy, that they seem to have hardly any problems at all. But God is putting you through the fire because you're his. You're no longer your own. He bought you with a price, the precious blood of Jesus. And if children, then heirs, and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. God wants you to be glorified together. He wants you to rule and reign with him. That's what he's doing. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. It's all going to be worth it. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. The weed whack, weed whacker. <laughs> It's, it's always the case, you know. You know, I should be able to do this fine because, you know, in street preaching we got honking horns, we got all kinds of noise and everything, so it shouldn't be a distraction. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but re by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. You know, the creature, the old creature, the old nature is just subject to vanity. You know that God says that you should forsake these vanities and serve a living God. People live for vain things. They think vain, vain things. There's nothing to their thoughts, nothing to their actions. It's all vanity, vanity of vanity. We went through Ecclesiastes, and uh, but we are a new creature in Jesus Christ. Our 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 inner man is, and we put God first and others before ourselves. We start getting that new nature deep within us that is not just self-serving. But we still have flesh that is not redeemed. And that creature will be delivered at the resurrection. Verse 21, because the creature itself also should be delivered from the bondage of corruption of the glorious liberty of the children of God. And our flesh will actually be redeemed too in that day. For we know that the whole creation grown up and travail and pain together until now. Everything does. This whole world is waiting for... Uh, the change that's going to take place when Christ comes here and he reigns and the lion 
or not the lion will lay down with the lamb, but the wolf will lay down with the lamb. <laughs> and uh, it's just gonna it's just gonna be all fixed when when Christ comes back. Look at uh, let's see, I can't hardly read my own right in here. Ecclesiastes seven eight. That's the next book over, or maybe next uh, two books over. Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 8. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and a patient in spirit is better than a proud in spirit. Better is the end than the beginning thereof. If you're a child of God, you can surely say that. You know why? Because your end is to be with Christ. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. You're going to gain when you uh, when you finish this race. And you, you have to be patient in spirit. Run this race with patience. Let's look at uh, Jeremiah 29, 11. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Isn't that great? The Lord said also in Thessalonians that he has not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation. He is not going to put us through that judgment, that seven-year judgment on the earth, that great tribulation, or any portion of the tribulation. He has not appointed us unto, unto wrath, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace. God wants you to live in peace, not in fear, not of evil. Sometimes evil comes because we're in a sinful world. But God, at the end, is going to give you an expected end. You can count on that. You can count on the God that never lies. That when he says, if you call upon me, whosoever shall call upon in the name of the Lord shall be saved, that you will be saved from the wrath to come, from hellfire, eternal damnation, from your sin in this life. God can deliver you from all kinds of things, from evil men. He wants to give you an expected end. Be confident in that. Uh, let's look at verse number 19. Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thy heart in the way. The heart is not to guide you, but the inward man, the heart. Solomon is speaking to his son. He has not the inward man. He has not the spirit of God uh, dwelling in him as the New Testament saint. But still that principle is true. You hear, you get the knowledge, and then you apply, and then you're wise. And you guide your heart in the way. Your heart is not to be your guide. You ever heard that? Let your heart be your guide. Listen to your heart, the song said. This is all misinformation by a misled world, by a lost world. God says you are to guide your heart, not your heart guide you. Your heart can condemn you. Your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So why would you listen to your heart? Why would you lean to your own understanding when the Word of God says something? You need to go with the Word of God, not what your heart is telling you. Because God has your best interest at heart, but the devil will try to twist your heart's emotions to get you not to trust God, to get you not to believe the Bible, and to get you to be a fool. And that's what you will be if you let your heart guide you. God says you guide your heart in the way, in the narrow way, in this book, and this word of God that you have before you. Be not among wine bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. If you're given over to the lust of your flesh, your flesh can never be satisfied. It will bring you to poverty. Uh, being drunk from over drinking, obviously, alcohol, or overeating is, is also a very bad thing. It can cause you to be drowsy. You ever ate too much food and you just get really tired and drowsy? But God doesn't want us walking in life all drowsy. He wants us to be sober. He wants us to be clear-minded. 
he wants us to sleep at night, yes, to recharge, but we should not just be so drunk that we're, or, or, or eating so much that we are not functioning in society. Be not among wine bibbers, among righteous eaters of flesh. We are not to run to the same excess of riot as, as a lost crowd. And uh, they, they, they called Jesus a wine bibber. And they called him a glutton. But that was super spiritual screwballs, as Don Green would say, or, or my pastor would say. They were just trying to look to find flaw with Jesus, just fault with Jesus with anything he would do. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we had we had uh, John the Baptist that didn't do any of that, and then they criticized him for that. So it didn't matter what you did. You're damned if you do or you're damned if you don't in the eyes of a religious crowd, the Pharisees. But no man can keep up with their need for alcohol. Uh, the, the pocket can't really... It, it'll empty your pockets. Uh, drug addictions and all this kind of thing. I mean, there's rich people, Hollywood stars that have gone broke because of their cocaine addictions and all this. And God says, I don't want you to live that way. I didn't save you for you to live in independence and all this. Uh, he says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. You need to be under the Holy Spirit's guidance. And uh, He can cause you to prosper. But but if you sit there and live like the lost, it's just going to bring, bring you to poverty and rags. Verse 22, Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. Solomon is telling his son, when your mother gets old, you need to be good to your mother, not despise her when you're king. She may offer counsel. Maybe you better listen to your mother sometimes. Not just despise her and say, woman, you don't know what you're talking about. You say, well, Jesus said that, but this is different. Jesus listened only to the, to the direction of the father. But Solomon is telling his son, don't you despise your mother. You be good to your mother even when you're king. And right now, hearken to your father that begat thee. Let's look at James chapter number 1 and verse number 18. No, that's not, that's not quite yet, I don't think. Let's, let's just go there. I got arrows going around on this, and it makes it kind of hard for me to understand what I was trying to do or when to go to this certain verse. his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures there's that word creatures again <laughs> well he begat us with the word of truth he's our heavenly father so you need to hearken to him maybe you got an earthly father and he's not giving you the right kind of advice because he's a heathen but God says I begat you you should listen to me and despise not your mother when she is old. And we just had Mother's Day, and I got the most blessed mother in the world, and she's she just loves her children, and she she'll give up everything just to 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 see to it that she helps us and blesses us, and she likes to cook for us and everything. And uh, what a wonderful mom! And she just gets better with age. Buy the truth, and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding by the truth. And then look what it says in verse 18 of James 1 again. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. So he is our father. He begat, look at verse 22, hearken unto thy father that begat thee. Now, if you're, like I said, you have a father that's not saved, and he's giving the wrong advice. You don't have to hearken to that advice when you're an adult. Hearken to the Father that begat thee by the word of truth. And then verse 23, by the truth. Cling to that truth. That's how you were begotten, by, by believing the truth, by obeying the gospel. 
you receive the truth, and not as the word of men, but, but as it is of God. You believe the truth because God cannot lie. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. And that's what this book of Proverbs is all about. This wisdom, this instruction, this knowledge, this understanding, everything that you receive here, do not sell it out. Do not put things before it. Do not seek worldly fame. Do not seek just prosperity. Do not just seek popularity. Do not seek friends on Facebook over fellowship with God. God says, buy the truth and sell it not. This ought to be the most valuable thing. If you got all your money together and had to buy one thing, you purchase the truth and you don't sell it. If the house is burning down, grab the Bible. And get your Bible out of there. This ought to be the most valuable thing to you because these are the words of truth. This is the wisdom of God. This is uh, the, the proper instructions for life. And it needs to be all the way up there. The word of God is above even the name of Jesus Christ. How important is it, is it in your life? God placed it to the utmost importance, even higher than the name of Jesus. The name that every knee shall bow to. Verse number 24. The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice. You know, you might have a lost father or a lost mother, and they, they might not care that you're saved. They might not care to even hear it. But the father of the righteous, who made you righteous? God the Father, through the Son. It's not your own righteousness, but he imputed righteousness to your account because you believed him. You believe the word of truth. The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice. And what happens when a sinner is converted? That there are there is uh, joy in the presence of the angels, right? Luke 15, verse 7. Luke 15, verse number 7. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. So that goes along with 24. The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice. That's what goes on when a sinner is saved. And I think even when he sees his children do right. And he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. Remember who begot you begotten of God. Look at verse number 15. My son, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. There's rejoicing, there's joy. You want to make your heavenly father rejoice? You want to bring him joy? Be a wise child, not a foolish child. Make application of the word of God in your life. Don't be just a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word. Guide your heart don't let your heart be your guide, and it will make him to be overwhelmed with joy. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. And what a blessing to honor your father and mother in that way. They will be glad when you walk in wisdom. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. You want to bless your mom, speak the right words. Make application of the Word of God in your life. Live for God all your days. And it would be a blessing to her heart. She don't have to worry about you, you know, getting in some drunken brawl, drunk driving. She doesn't have to worry about just what the average mother of a, of a lost child has to worry about. She shouldn't even have to have sleepless nights when you make the application of the word of God, you want to cause your father and your mother to be glad. And she that bear thee shall rejoice. I want to be a blessing to my mother. I want her to rejoice when she thinks of her son. And there's been many times in my life where she wasn't rejoicing, I'm sure, because I was living contrary to the word of God. And uh, that ought not to be so. You know what? Honor your mom. Bless your mom. Despise her not in her old age. Cause her to rejoice. 
and and I know my mom would want nothing more of her children than for them to live for God all the days of their life, put Him first in everything, and that's what brings her joy. My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. And it's going to be the last verse. My son, give me thine heart. That's what God's after. He's always been after the heart. Salvation is a matter of the heart. Trusting God daily is a matter of the heart. Believing his promises is a matter of the heart. My son, give me thine heart, Solomon says. And God says the same to the New Testament saint. My son, give me thine heart. Don't take it back. You gave me your heart at salvation. Don't try to take that back. Live in submission to me because I have your best interests at heart. I love you and I'm your father. And let thine eyes observe my ways. But it's hard to observe his ways if you don't know anything about his ways. That's why I commend you to get in the word of God each and every day. Start your day with the word of God and you will be observing his ways and, 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 and if you have the right heart, God will allow you to retain it. God will help you to apply it. He can get you to begin on the right path if you're on the wrong path and you can begin to observe his ways and you can cause your earthly parents to be happy. You can cause your heavenly father to be happy. You can cause the saints to rejoice with you as you walk in truth and, uh, you know what, this is what God would have for you. This has been approved unto God, and I hope you join me again next time. And also, if you have not liked or subscribed, uh, you know, that will help out this channel quite a bit. And I uh, appreciate it. I, I like hearing from people and uh, responding sometimes if they have any questions or anything. And I would like to help. That's what I'm here for, you know. And I like preaching, but... A lot of the ministry is not just preaching, but it's ministering. If I can help you and minister to you, I would like to do that. So uh, go ahead and reach out if you can. I, I appreciate it. God bless.